It's not so much how they happened. BP's oil well and Exxon's super tanker were polar opposites on cause. But it turns out the fishermen and the communities who lived through their spill can tell us a lot. Tonight, the first of our series of exclusive reports, Northern Exposure, Lessons from Valdez. Let me find an 89 for us. That's 99, 97. R.J. Kopchak was a commercial fisherman in 1989 when 11 million <laughs> gallons of this. You just don't like this kind of thing. Exxon Valdez Oil forever changed his life. Yes, it looks like something you'd want to put on your ice cream sundae, doesn't it? It certainly is not compatible, however, with living things and delicate tissue. It just doesn't work. Exxon and the government were caught flat-footed. Not enough boom, short on workers, a pathetic lack of urgency. Critical hours were lost as the tanker belched its load into the sound. So we were woefully and inadequately prepared. Local fishermen like Mike Weber sprung into action to save a salmon hatchery. On our way to San Juan, we were right in the middle of the sound, right, and you could really smell the, the oil. The hatchery was spared, but Exxon had wasted three days of excellent weather. On day four, seas kicked up and coated 1,400 miles of rocky beach with oil. For 12 years prior to 1989, tankers had run out of the port of Valdez without major incident. The Trans-Alaska Pipeline, a marvel of engineering, runs 800 miles from Alaska's north slope to Valdez. And this may sound familiar, onto the doorstep of some of the world's richest fisheries. In many ways, Valdez is the natural spot for the terminal. This is the northernmost ice-free port in America. It's navigable all year long. Navigable, but at times treacherous. This is usually where we see most of the ice. At its command center in Valdez, the Coast Guard is on a constant vigil for ice. As recently as this past month, we've had uh, birdie bits and growlers up in the port. Okay. Lieutenant Commander Aaron Williams speaks a whole different language. A growler would be the size of a car, a uh, birdie bit like the size of a house. On this day, the Coast Guard orders part of the shipping lanes reduced to one-way traffic. Hazards lurk within one mile of the route tankers would take to and from the port. And that gives the tankers the capability to basically use the entire road. Alaska's response to a major spill today would be a far cry from what happened in 1989 or, for that matter, in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico. Under Alaska state law, the industry must demonstrate it can respond to a spill of 300,000 barrels within 72 hours. 300 fishing vessels are poised to jump into the response, up to 150 people on standby at any one time. The pipeline company, Alieska, has staged 49 miles of boom, 10 times more than in 1989. I would imagine that Prince William Sound has the safest transportation of oil on the water anywhere in the world. And there are bodyguards for the tankers. Two beefy tugboats escort each ship trafficking through the port, one of them tethered to the tanker. And the top of the barge has skimmers and small boats and booms. Barges and equipment are stationed in strategic spots to cut precious hours off response time. And one final critical weapon in the arsenal, a vigilant public. The citizens, the folks with the most to lose if something happens, stay engaged. Mark Swanson used to be the Coast Guard captain in the port of Valdez and later a Shell oil executive in charge of spill response. Today, he works for these people the Prince William Sound Regional Citizens Advisory Council. So we're ready. Um, and the reason we're ready is because the Citizens Oversight Group helps make sure that the oil companies and the state of Alaska both fulfill their responsibilities. The same 1990 law that governs how BP responds to the Gulf oil spill set up a one-of-a-kind citizen watchdog, an independent group paid for by the oil companies to look over their shoulders and those of regulators. Three million dollars this year. But after spending en enough time in enough rooms talking essentially only to each other, regulators and the regulated industry come to think alike. Remember those double escorts for the tankers? The industry was quietly talking about losing one of them until the RCAC started making noise. The oil companies would like us to get rid of one. And we've been saying, no, no, no. 
Today, the pipeline says it has no plans to gut the escorts, but the citizens group would like Congress to put that protection in the law. The RCAC hires staff, engineers, and other expert consultants. The idea, a fresh set of eyes, independent of politics and profit. We can't make a rule, we can't levy a fine, we can't give any kind of order whatever. So what good are they if they have no authority? In Alaska, once RCAC said something, the rest of the public is on their case. If the idea of citizen oversight strikes you as a bunch of do-gooders without a sense of reality or wacky environmentalist, think again. People who would say that probably would do so because there's nothing like us anywhere else in the country as far as we know. So there's no model. Nobody's ever seen something on television like us. They've never read about it in the newspaper. So when they hear about us, they think, so what is this, Greenpeace? Council members are drawn from communities impacted by the spill, industries, fishermen, the Alaska State Chamber of Commerce, tourist groups. Only one environmental group has a seat on the board. And long before the Deepwater Horizon, there could have been similar groups for the Gulf of Mexico. Well, I think it's a fair comparison, and it breaks our heart. Um, because in 1990, um, Again, big oil was able to keep the provisions out of the Oil Prevention Act of 90 from applying to the Gulf of Mexico. Kopchak says in 1990, the industry convinced Congress citizen oversight in the Gulf of Mexico was overkill. In the Gulf of Alaska, spill response these days gets helped along by an extra set of eyes. I don't think oil industry wants us here, and I don't think if there hadn't been sort of the, the sort of moral outrage following the spill here that it would have ever happened. The Regional Citizen Advisory Council grew out of a push by Alaskans for more of a say on issues related to shipping. It's a lot like uh, citizens in New Orleans pushing for consolidating the levee boards after Katrina. Tomorrow night, we'll take you to an Alaskan island where you can turn over a rock and find oil 21 years after Valdez. <laughs>